Hi, welcome to my channel Cardiology and Beyond. I'm Dr. Sonali, an interventional cardiologist from India. I'll be again presenting one more video which will be heavily based on concepts, active recall and mind mapping. Today's video is going to be about aortic stenosis versus hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy in terms of their pressure tracings. In order to mind map today's video, we are essentially dealing with a topic in hemodynamics and we are going to be dealing with both the left ventricular as well as the aortic pressure tracing and they both contribute to a left ventricular outflow tract gradient in terms of disease states. So we are going to be speaking about AS and HOCM and these are a few questions with regards to both of them. So go through these questions, see if you can answer some of them and if not we're just going to be tackling them one by one. Now the obvious first question is that what is the indication for a hemodynamic study in a case of aortic stenosis? Now we know that every case of aortic stenosis does not require a CAT study. However, if there's a discrepancy between clinical examination and non-invasive imaging findings, then we consider a hemodynamic study. And most commonly, we use an echo to get an idea about the severity of aortic stenosis. What is the anacrotic notch which is seen on the aortic pressure tracing? Now, this is sometimes seen, this notch is seen when you do a CAT study of a patient and you happen to come across it and you wonder what does it signify? Well, essentially, this is a notch which is seen on the systolic upstroke of the aortic pressure tracing. Now, this is the LV pressure tracing, which we'll be talking about subsequently. And this is the aortic pressure tracing. So this is the systole, which is the early part of systole, wherein you see a notch. It follows the initial early upstroke. So this is the initial early upstroke, after which you get this notch. So the aortic valve has opened here. You get an initial early upstroke of this aortic pressure tracing and then you get a notch. What does the presence of this notch signify? It means there is early cessation of aortic opening and slowing of the flow of blood. That is what it means. So essentially when you see a notch, it means that the aortic valve is being hesitant because it is not very pliable. It is not able to open completely because of the presence of aortic stenosis. So in a way, the presence of an anacrotic notch means that it points to the presence of a severe aortic stenosis. Describe the left ventricular and aortic pressure tracings in cases of severe aortic stenosis. Now the shape of these aortic pressure tracings and how they behave give a clue to tell us whether the left ventricular outflow tract obstruction is at the valvar or at the subvalvar level. And a subvalvar level most commonly would be because of HOCM. So here we are talking about severe valvar stenosis because of uh, valvar aortic stenosis. So what happens in it as we've seen before is that this aortic pressure tracing which is seen in red has a slow upstroke after the anacrotic notch. So I've already described this particular uh, up, some tiny upstroke to be an anacrotic notch and after it the upstroke is very slow and then it peaks very late. So this is what gives rise to a clinical evidence of a pulse called pulsus parvus et tardis. So tardis means late, being tardy is late, so it is peaking late. And parvis means that the overall pulse is small, it is short. So pulses parvis et tardis points to the fact that if you put a catheter in the aorta, you get a slow upstroke after the presence of an anacrotic notch and this upstroke peaks late. So what happens to the LV pressure tracing? The LV pressure tracing in, uh, in relation to the aortic pressure tracing peaks quite early. So this is peculiar to severe valvar aortic stenosis. What are the various gradients obtained in a case of severe valvar aortic stenosis? Now there are three types of gradients that we get in the cath lab when there are two catheters, one in the LV and one in the aorta. Sometimes, more commonly, in the cath lab, a single catheter is used to do a pullback from the LV into the aorta and gradients are obtained. So there are three gradients. One is peak to peak gradient, then a peak instantaneous gradient and a mean gradient. 
So now this is the LV pressure uh, tracing and this is the aortic pressure tracing. They do not superimpose in systole, so it obviously means that there is some kind of an obstruction at this level. And we need to get more information so that we'll know what is the degree of obstruction or the degree of severity in this case of valvular aortic stenosis. So now we have the two peaks of aorta and LV pressure tracings. They do not occur simultaneously because the aortic, aortic pressure tracing peaks quite late with respect to the LV pressure tracing which relatively peaks earlier. So the difference between this, these two that is LV and aortic peaks gives rise to a peak to peak gradient. The next type of gradient is the peak instantaneous gradient. It is defined as the largest difference between the two pressure tracings and here we get it this is the largest difference between the two pressure tracings. So one fallacy is that if you take a peak to peak gradient in the cat lab that will essentially underestimate the true severity of aortic stenosis. The peak instant instantaneous gradient occurs at the same time and essentially this gradient is the same peak gradient which is obtained by echocardiography non-invasively. The mean gradient. The mean gradient is the integration of all the gradients in the shaded area. So here you can see this entire thing is the mean gradient. And that is the same principle that we use when you get a continuous wave Doppler and you trace the entire Doppler curve on echo to get the mean gradient of the aortic stenosis non-invasively. The mean gradient is obviously not as, as large as the peak instantaneous gradient. It is in fact 70% of the peak instantaneous gradient and it will always be less than the peak instantaneous gradient. Now that we've understood the LV and aortic pressure tracings in case of valvular aortic stenosis, let's describe the same pressure tracings in cases of hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. So this blue tracing points to the LV pressure tracing, whereas the red one points to the aortic pressure tracing. So what happens with the aortic pressure tracing of HOCM is that it peaks very early. There is early aortic pressure peaking within the first 80 milliseconds of systole and that gives rise to an early spike. So after the aortic valve opens, we have an early spike over here. Then in mid to late systole, obstruction worsens. So essentially in HOCM, obstruction worsens later on, whereas in valvular AS, obstruction is worse from the beginning. So that gives rise to a lower dome. So the spike is no longer there, which is seen in early systole, and so you get a smaller dome of the aortic pressure tracing. So you get a very classic spike and dome appearance of the aorta. Spike and dome. And as opposed to this, the LV pressure tracing peaks very late. So there is late peaking of the LV, whereas in valvular AS, there is early peaking of the LV pressure tracing because the gradient in HOCM here is late, whereas the gradient in valvular AS occurs early on. Can a spike and dome pulse of HOCM be felt clinically? Yes. It is in fact called the bisphyrian pulse, or in other words, double systolic peaks. Also, we've learned that pulses at TARDIS of aortic stenosis can be felt as a slow rising pulse. So as always, like, share, subscribe, comment and press the bell icon and I'll see you next time with another video.